All right, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. We're talking about pain and injury management in the lifter, all right? So specifically, we've covered how to get a good history on like what's going on pain-wise, how to start coming up with a differential diagnosis, all right, like uh, potential issues that could be wrong, and that will help you decide if we need a higher level of care, if we need to significantly adjust training, or also even how to ask a good question. So for, for instance, you know, a question is, I have pain in my hip. That, that doesn't work, you know, but, but so, so because that's one, the hip's big area too. We don't know like how long it's been going away. We have no history. We have no context. Um, but if I went on your Instagram live and I was like, look, Austin, I have anterior hip pain at the base of my inguinal ligament. It's been present for three days after a high volume squatting session. There was no, there were no pops, clicks, tears, or other mechanical deficits that occurred during this started 30 minutes after my session. Uh, it's painful to walk, <laughs> and uh, but I have no noticeable um, numbness, muscle weakness. It just hurts when I walk, particularly with hip flexion. It's better when I'm laying down flat. That gives that's I'm just giving an example. That is the breadth of like history needed to even attempt coming up with to like, get close, yeah. right? With some sort of hey, I think you might sh you might do this. This would be a better a good option. And in that case, that specific case, you'd be like, mm, I think you need to go see a doctor. <laughs> well, seriously, because at that point, you're like, you know, there might be actually some serious, something seriously wrong uh, as far as the tissue integrity is going, and you wanna, you'd want probably want to know. If there was a specific uh, physical exam finding that would require like an MRI or an ultrasound or something like that. But probably not an x-ray, unless you thought it was a fracture. Yeah. All right. So what's the worst thing that somebody could do at this point? The worst thing. We got an acute injury, no red flag signs on a history. Um, they, we don't require imaging, don't require a uh, high level of care. Uh, your differential diagnosis is all soft tissue stuff that doesn't require surgery. Yeah. What's the worst thing that somebody could do? So the worst, I would say, things that they can do would be all of those things. They could, number one, stop moving, stop training, say they need to take a break from everything and say they need to take a week off. They might go to a doctor, insist on getting an MRI, insist on getting pain medicines. Um, those would those would collectively be the worst things that someone could do in this sort of situation. All right, so let's, uh, let's make this even a little more specific. We have a person who's on starting strength novice LP. Um, after their set of five deadlifts, they have delayed onset low back pain. So it occurs after they're done doing deadlifts, it stiffens up a little bit more that night. Uh, the next day, it's a little bit. They're a little more stiff. They're freaked out. They happen to catch you on Instagram Live, Austin, and you know for whatever reason you've entertained them through the DMs, and they have they have no red flag symptoms. You feel pretty confident that this is not, uh, you know, caught equina syndrome or sure. like is that right, anesthesia right. or anything going on. So, in general, how would you manage this? What would be your go-to? So yeah. Uh, Basically, it's going to be, again, reassurance and getting them to continue moving around and moving through those ranges of motion that at first might be a little uncomfortable, but typically in these situations, when you get somebody who is not completely freaked out and afraid for their life and you can get them to move through some of these ranges of motion, within a few minutes or a few reps, they'll actually say that, hey, I'm, this is actually starting to feel better. I feel it loosening up, things like that. But the more they're panicked and sitting still, rigid at home, lying on the heating pad or the pack of ice or something like that because they think that just, you know, complete rest is what's needed for the next two weeks before they can, you know, even step foot in the gym again. Those are those are going to be the, the, the people who get worse outcomes out of it. Right. The, and, and I would further add that I'm not so I'm not terribly convinced that just because your back got stiff and you felt it after deadlifting that a deadlift caused it and it, two that you need to do anything besides just keep going about your normal life. And train on Friday or train the, <laughs> train the next day because uh, so effectively my management in this sort of situation would be very similar keep moving reassurance don't panic proceed as normal until proven otherwise uh, be, be, so it's not abnormal and it's not necessarily normal for your low back to be tight after deadlifts yeah it's and, it's, not, and, and interesting anecdotes are that actually for both of us for you and for me we've both recently competed and exactly one week out from both of our meets, both of us experienced a some sort of a back tweak or a back stiffness or something like that that happened in the gym. Mine was during pin squats. I forget what you were doing when you did yours. 
And uh, I think I was having and, a bowel movement. You might. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, you know, taking this approach, seven days later, we both went and competed, and you know, did fine. It's one of those things. Like it's not. You know. Yeah. We we jokingly said, "Oh, I got a back tweak. I'm ready to compete now." So it's it's like. Uh, so yeah, we I think that the normal experience of training is going to be that sometimes things get sore, stiff, tight. You have some non-specific pain, and none of it is worrisome unless accompanied by other red flag symptoms, which are going to be very different depending on the joint. Um, and so that being the case, our management is very similar that we would just continue to train. And so we've assessed technique to see if there's any like gape, you know, gaping biomechanical reason for you to have pain likely caused by either tendinopathy to, uh, uh, that is again a generic term or some sort of a structural defect that you're like actually putting yourself at risk to tear something right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay and so if that's not the case the next thing we probably move on to is programming and and the way i view this again is more of a fatigue management situation so if the fatigue generated by the program outstrips the resources by which somebody can recover from, I think pain is likely. It non-specific pain. Things are tight. Things are beat up. And you know sometimes that'll happen even if the fatigue is correct. But I I feel like most of the time, when the fatigue is far too high, people have more significant, more long-lasting pain, and ultimately they think they're injured. You know, and 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 so, uh, do you have a similar take on this, or you think? something else is going on programming wise. So, uh, yeah, basically <clears throat> the, uh, injured, injured, even a, even a tissue that's injured or is in pain, it still requires some amount of stress. And right. so rest, complete rest is essentially never the answer for these things. Um, and so there's some interesting stuff out there that I've looked at when I've looked into the tendinopathy stuff. So basically we know that you know, if you have a if you have a skeletal muscle, for example, and you are failing to load it throughout the lifespan, for example, we talk about this muscle protein synthesis, muscle protein breakdown deal, and on on you know on the whole, over time, you get this net muscle protein breakdown, you get degeneration, loss of muscle mass, sarcopenia, weakness, all that stuff in older age. Similarly, when you have uh, tendons, actually, there's this whole world of tendon research that uh, we don't talk about quite as much, but there's collagen protein synthesis and collagen protein breakdown because tendons, just like muscles and bones, are in this constant flux of building, breaking down, remodeling, things like that in response to stress. It's like matrix metalloproteases. Exactly. So matrix metalloproteinases are these enzymes, very nice, that are involved in remodeling the tendons. And so... When you when you when you overload them, uh, kind of typically in a cyclic nature, that's the that's the main uh, precipitating factor thought to be involved is cyclic loading uh, that generates in tendinopathy. That you get this increased activity of these enzymes, and it starts to you know cause progressive uh, tendon degeneration and, and and damage, and we call that tendinopathy. But similarly, at the other end of the spectrum, it's been measured. There's data on this showing that the the activity of those enzymes goes way up in the setting of tendon underloading as well. And so you can get when when you don't train. So it's not surprising that you get kind of degeneration and loss of these structures in the in the absence of loading and stress. So I say all that basically to say that there are there are going to be people out there who listen to this and they still think that if something hurts, they need to sit on the couch for a week and rest it. And that's just not the way to do these things. The idea is that you you know when it comes to programming, we're balancing the we're, we're trying to find that balance of the stress and the recovery that results in the the, the greatest amount of adaptation um, over time. And so you have to dose your stress correctly, and you have to dose your stress correctly when lifters are healthy. But when they're injured or when they're in pain, they might require a modification of their of the dose of their stress. And so we talk about programming variables all the time. Comes up with exercise selection and volume and intensity and frequency and things like that that might need to be modified in the setting of someone who has pain or is injured. But also you need to think about what do I do once this person feels better again? Once they're healthy and they're back to normal training, do I go back and I do the same thing that got them injured before? If you if you if you think you found a very compelling technique reason that you think exacerbated it, you might consider working them over working them up over time to something like that. But if if not, then you might have done something stupid in their programming. It might have been that you were had them grinding just absolute max weights every session. Beyond that, you might be, you might have somebody who's programming, you know, doing German volume training, which we've talked about 
where that came from and all that before. 10 sets of 10, a couple times a week, stuff like that. That might be a completely inappropriate. It actually, in fact, is. I'll just go ahead and say it is yeah, an, a completely no inappropriate dose for, any, for everybody. For everybody. If, if you're doing German volume training, you don't care about your training results. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you'll, similarly, their frequency might be off, their exercise selection might be off. So all that kind of stuff goes into kind of dosing the stress correctly. Yep. Yeah. You know, and I think we can, we'll sum that, this little, we'll tie this up neatly. You're suggesting that for loading tendons, there's a bell-shaped curve that exists. So if you're on the far right end, it's too, too much. You get increased uh, activity of these enzymes that are shown to degrade and, you know, ultimately lead to some tendinopathy. And if you're underdosed, you get similar sort of processes, you know, even though you may not expect that. You'd expect it to be linear, but in fact, it's actually a, a bell-shaped curve. And I think each individual has their bell-shaped curve, how they respond to different training variables, you know, within some sort of normative distribution. Yeah. Um, my argument based on the current evidence, my, my thought process rather based on the current evidence is that intensity likely portends a much stronger effect as far as as far as which way you're moving so if the intensity is incorrect what i mean then that likely can can really mess up somebody from a from a pain a pain standpoint just due to way too much fatigue even if the volume is not that high uh and then also a a, a pain uh, just a you know a tendinopathy or or uh, a soft tissue injury and it's not just the act, the absolute loading, it's the relative loading. It's if you're a 700 pound squatter and you're doing five RMs all the time, you're working at, you know, with 615 for a set of five. And that's a very stressful event. That's very fatiguing compared to working with, you know, 525. F 525, not only can you use better technique if we think there's a biomechanical cause, but you can... Uh, it doesn't cause as much fatigue. You can do more reps. You can get in strengthen strengthen that soft tissue, and it's unlikely to cause this tendinopathy sort of issue, particularly if technique is good. Yeah. And I I think that's just a when people say that high volume beats them up a bunch, my go to response is yeah, but you're doing it the wrong intensity. Mm -hmm. Most often, I think that's probably the case. Yeah. So so when we have folks in this situation, if we've ruled out any kind of really uh, obvious, overt, severe technical issues, um, basically what I look at is what happens when you start warming up to train. And if you start warming up to train and it starts to feel better as you warm up, that's super reassuring. It's reassuring to me. It should be really reassuring to you. Um, and then, uh, and, and then I say you're okay to train that movement, but you might need to adjust one of these programming variables, which is going to likely be intensity at that point. Just at that point, it definitely. <laughs> I mean, but you you've ruled yourself in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because yourself. it's getting better as you warm up, and you should you should be able to handle it. But on the in the other situation, if it gets worse the more you warm up, if every time you add twenty pounds to the bar or something like that, it starts to hurt worse. That is a relatively more concerning situation. And not I won't say concerning to the point where, hey, you need to run to the ER and panic, but it just means that, hey, we should probably not be training that specific movement right now. And we might need to temporarily find some other movement we can use while we get this fixed up with the goal of ultimately getting you back to the activities that you want to do. There's actually been some research, uh, I remember some papers that are titled something along the lines of like, is it okay to exercise into pain in these situations or is it okay to train to the point where things are uncomfortable, and they actually suggested that it's okay. It's fine. Um, <laughs> but you know, I I wonder how you know how much that's necessary if we can find other viable ways to train that don't cause pain, and then in the long run, kind of work them back to where we want them to be, rather than them walking into every session basically expecting to be pain, uncomfortable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, because that you know. If, if and so that like... comes into play when we talk about various tendinopathies, and and some people or, you know, going and doing these kind of programs that really intentionally piss off the tendons more with the hope that it makes them heal. And I do not recommend those to people and I don't have people do those. Yeah. I don't think that's a very, I don't think that's a very good management decision. Um, yeah. but for another, for another time. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but I do think, yeah, this does test the coach's creativity, uh, with, Tra uh, training to programming different movements, you know, so I was like, oh, okay, well, let's say we can't squat, uh, back, can't back squat with the bar in the low bar position because of knee pain. Yeah. Okay, well, can you box squat above parallel? 
Can you do another squatting variation? Belt squat, safety squat bar, right. squat. Uh, okay, you can't do any of those. Can you leg press? Do you have access yeah, to so a leg this press? Is this is actually one of the things that I, I, I hope, I would consider this to be like a take home point for people. Pearl. Um, yeah, super major, super important pearl. Remember this when next time something hurts. Basically my universal thing when I have somebody who complains about pain with a certain movement, my question number one, after I've looked at their technique, I say, is there a weight that you can put on the bar that you can do this main lift with that doesn't hurt? So they say my low bar squat, I have pain here. Okay. You have 500 on the bar right now. If I put 135 on the bar, can you squat it with the same, with, with perfect technique and it doesn't hurt? If they can, then I start them there and I work them up. It might be something of like an aggressive or a more rapid LP or something like that where I'm adding more weight at a time. Sure. But that is what I'm doing is I'm finding a weight where it doesn't hurt and working them up over from there because if, they, if there's a weight that they can find and execute that doesn't hurt, then that rules out a whole bunch of stuff, right? right. right? That itself tells me it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. Well, there's... So, all right, I'll, I'll counter with three things. I'll let you respond to each of them. Do you think, this is thing one, <laughs> do you think that at any point when you're, tell, do you tell them, hey, you got 500 on the bar, let's put 135, do it with perfect technique, and then they see that it doesn't hurt. Did you just nocebo them? That any time that their technique slips, they're going to have pain? That's a good point. Yeah, you might. If you, if, you, if, if, you point, well, <laughs> if you point out and you say, yeah, I think your 500 pain is because you got a little bit onto your toes or something like that, which I would find, a hard, find it difficult to make a case that that's causing somebody's pain, you know. Sure. So um, we'll, just have to, we'll just have to not <laughs> say that. Just be like, yeah, well, this is a place where we can start and we'll go back exactly. there. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah. Um, second thing, Bill Star Rehab. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Bill Star Rehab, it is you're going to do 20 set, or, uh, five sets of 20 reps starting at just the bar with whatever the movement that you were doing when you got hurt, that's what you're gonna do. Five sets 20, and that's it, you do it every day and you add weight, and you add weight, and you add weight. And so it's like, for instance, if you tore your hamstring, you're gonna do deadlifts, doing deadlifts, you're gonna do deadlifts. Or if you tore your hamstring, you know, doing something else, deadlifts probably stress the hamstring the most, so you're gonna do five sets of 20, add, you know, 20 pounds each day until you get to a sure. point where you can only do 10. So this probably works well for muscle tears What's your opinion on it for like a low back pain? Anything else not to do it. Right. So so that's pearl number 2. Yeah. So there are there are certain situations where you need something of an injury specific approach. Mm -hmm. Um and so this is why we go through all this history try to figure out what the diagnosis is because there are some situations that need a unique approach. So tendinopathy is not going to do very well with super super light, super super high volume work like what you're describing right, right. now. Right. Tendons, in particular, particularly that collagen protein synthetic response, suppressing your metallic, metalloproteinase, all that kind of stuff, tendons in particular respond well to heavy loading. Um, and so, you know, if I have somebody with a tendinopathy, I might have them do a bunch of real heavy isometrics. There's some evidence that those can actually acutely reduce pain. And then once I've reduced pain, I can get them to train, and that can hopefully stimulate some adaptation in the tissues. I am not going to do super heavy isometrics on a guy who just tore a muscle. That would be really stupid. So right. there is room for some injury specific approach. And in fact, there's even room for isolation type movements in some of these situations because nope. a lot of times people, no, never. <laughs> nope. there, there are situations where somebody is, is hurting and they're afraid and they are gonna alter their movement patterns to basically unload the affected tissue. And so it's like, look, I need to stress this tissue. You're not letting me stress this tissue with a squat because you keep shifting over to your other leg, for example, because you hurt. So I'm going to put you on the leg press and you're going to, you know, do just that leg on the leg press. Or you're going to do, you know, gasp. You might be on the knee extension or something like that where I can get some adaptation started. I can get your brain to calm down and then I can long term get you back under the bar. Yep. So injury specific approaches can be helpful in a lot of situations. And that's why there's this whole field of physical therapy that is out there and why people, you know, train to learn some of this stuff. Yeah, so this is then this actually does tail, dovetails nicely into my third point. So we're talking about an acute or chronic injury situation that doesn't require surgery, all right, uh, that we're going to try to quote unquote train through. And we're talking about specific interventions that we're trying, specific modifications to the, either the programming variables uh, or the approach, uh, like the or technique, um, in order to fix this, right? How many physical therapists, in your estimation, are equipped to handle this decision in the context of a an athlete or uh, or a lifter? 
exceedingly few. I know of some, and in fact I've surrounded myself with some of the most educated, I suppose, in my social sphere. Um, and so that biases my opinion to like, oh man, these guys are great. I'm sure they have tons of people who are commenting on their threads. I'm sure there's loads of physical therapists just like them who know exactly what to do with these people. But when I zoom out even further and I know how many you know therapists there are out in the world, it's exceedingly few who right. would be able to manage some of this stuff appropriately. Right. So there's not, yeah. So we're not bashing on the field. It's just, it's a, you're not trained this way. And so this, if you ask these physical therapists, so for instance, our, our friend, uh, 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 I'm spacing on his name, Derek, Derek Miles. Derek Miles, yeah. yep. Um, if you ask him, you know, how did you accrue this knowledge? He's like, well, I just have read every single paper that's ever been published. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then also that's, that's combined with his actual practical experience we have in himself. And then, you know, he's had to be exposed to strength training and kind of understand the strength, stress recovery adaptation cycle. And, and if you don't, if that's not the central paradigm of your pr clinical practice, then your clinical practice is just not terribly useful. And further, I mean, here, here's the thing. You don't need to, no one needs to go see the physical therapist multiple times per week for this, right? If you have a post-surgical joint contracture, if you have, you know, some sort of situation where they're actually going and man manually having to do something because you can't do it on your own, you don't have the specific instruction, specific training to go that far, okay, sure. But they're not managing these variables for, you know, and, and all their, and, and the soft tissue therapy that's a whole separate topic, yeah, entirely. That's it's another crazy. podcast. Yeah. That's another yeah. podcast. Yeah, but yeah. but but the short of it is, save your money. Um, <laughs> the short is so. Yeah. This puts us nicely. Wait. You, wait. <laughs> All right. My take home points. I only got through one take home okay, point. Sorry. So so the, so the take home points from when it comes to the so we're talking about figuring out the stress, optimizing the dose of stress, right? So there's the dose of stress, which is our programming variables. There's what I call the formulation of the dose of, of the stress, which is the exercise selection. So, so when I have somebody squatting and they say they have pain, I can find a weight where they can do it and it doesn't hurt, great, perfect. And I start them from there and they go up. But if they say, no, I put 135 on the bar and I say, well, put 45 on the bar. Can you squat? And they say, nope, still hurts. Then my question is, is there a portion of the range of motion that you can move through on that main lift that doesn't hurt? So if it's a low bar squat, can you low bar squat to a box or to above parallel pins or something like that where you don't have pain? If you can do that, then I start you there. We get you stronger. We drop the pins down or we drop the box lower. Once you're below parallel, you try squatting again. If you don't hurt anymore, perfect. So step one was find a weight that doesn't hurt. Step two was find a rate range of motion that doesn't hurt. If there is no range of motion that doesn't hurt, low bar squatting to a really high pins, to quarter squat pins, that still hurts, then I have to find a different lift for you to do. Is there a variant that you can do? So, hey, can you front squat? Can you high bar? Can you even leg press? As you said, is there some other variant that I can do? And I might even start over there on that variant the whole process over again. If you can front squat and you're like, yeah, I can front squat, but it hurts in the very bottom. Well, hey, what if you front squat to pins that are set at parallel? or right above parallel, and they start there. Well, there I found my starting point, and I'm gonna work you up till you can do a full front squat, then I'm gonna put the bar on your back, then I'm gonna get you back to low bar squatting. So those, when it comes to kind of uh, optimizing the actual exercise that I'm using, uh, assuming we're talking about somebody who wants to do these kind of main lifts that we talk about, squat, press, deadlift, bench, I'm gonna start with the main lift, find a weight, use the main lift with a partial range of motion, or find a variant of that lift. That's like my answer to the vast majority of these, uh, a whole lot of these situations in addition to just looking at their programming and see if it's uh, intelligent or not. I agree, that's good. It's a good set of pearls. All right, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about the nocebo effect. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. Hopefully you guys are enjoying it. I wanted to take a second and talk about GainsRx. GainsRx is now shipping Amazon Prime if you get it on their website. And through our website, you can get a subscription where GainsRx is delivered to your door every month for a $5 discount per tub. The idea is that you take GainsRx pre and post workout. It's got all the right ingredients to maximize your performance, improve recovery, and ultimately give you the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to exercise supplementation. A lot of people ask me, hey, Jordan, why did you even make this supplement in the first place. Well, at the time, I was recommending people take all these different supplements. They'd have to get multiple bottles, dose the things properly, and people just weren't doing it. It was too hard to do. So I put it all in one supplement. You take one scoop before, one scoop after, and you're done. So the idea was if you were going to supplement anyway and you wanted to take stuff that was actually going to work, let's put it all in one supplement. 
will put it out on the market and see how it does. There's been a ton of people who have told me that they've gotten great results from it. Looks like things are going well. And so you can get Gains RX at the barbellmedicine.com store or you can get it on Amazon. We really appreciate you guys. And thanks for listening. Make sure that you give us some feedback on our podcasts and we'll catch you guys later. Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. We're here on the last segment of our pain injury, what to do if you're a lifter and you have pain podcast. Austin, I don't want you to get triggered. I we're going to we're gonna talk about the nocebo effect. So first, let's define what's the, what is the nocebo effect. So people are probably unfamiliar with what this is. They're probably much more familiar with the placebo effect is. And it comes from some, I don't know, Greek or Latin that actually placebo meaning like I shall please meaning that uh, you you end up with this kind of outcome that um, you know is is your expectations of a certain outcome uh, end up influencing said outcome so if you expect that uh, a certain treatment is going to relieve your pain it's more likely to relieve your pain nocebo is kind of the converse of that and it's in my opinion at least as if not more interesting, where negative expectations about a certain treatment or a certain event results in worse outcomes. Yes. No, ser, no ser means to harm. There you go. To Whereas harm. placer so, means to heal. Right? Yeah. So I recently shared an article about this that just came out in, I think it was JAMA last week, that small, was titled small, The small. Iatrogenic Potential of the Physician's Words. And iatrogenic just basically means like things that we do to patients. So the effect of physicians' words on their patients and their outcomes. So to anybody who is more interested in this topic, they definitely should go look that article up and read it. It is excellent, along with following through on a number of its citations. So basically... The idea is that uh, the words that we use clinically when we're talking about some of these things with patients, it influences their understanding and their expectations about whatever condition we're talking about. And those that understanding and those expectations can then influence their outcomes from it. And so the more clinical experience I've accrued, the more people that I've worked with and seen how they practice and how they talk to patients, I see it just about every day where I see something and I'm like, that just harmed the patient, <laughs> that right. just harmed the patient. And so, you know, we take this oath to do no harm. And yet every day I'm seeing this language used that is harming patients. Of course, it's unrecognized. The physicians don't know they're doing it. Uh, they don't know what the nocebo effect even is um, because there's more ways to harm a patient than to go and cause an adverse outcome by botching a surgery or giving them the wrong medicine or something like that. So for example, we see things all the time where Patients will end up, say, say in that kind of early acute phase of back pain, they go and they manage to get some imaging done. Statistically, by age, you go up, the higher the likelihood that you're going to find something on whatever scan you're doing, right? You're going to find some spondylosis, some arthritis, some horrific, terrifying sounding degenerative disc disease. You're going to find okay. bulging discs, herniated discs. You might find some spinal stenosis, some spondylolisthesis, all kinds of things that can happen. Um, not all of which are causing the patient's symptoms. Uh, as an aside, have you ever ha have you ever had any imaging of your back done? Dude, uh, ten out of ten would recommend. You got some done? Oh yeah. So like when I my hips, <laughs> so they just yeah. did it. It was an MR. I did both hips, and then they had my low back in there. I didn't get a specific like an MR L spot, but anyway. So how many how many uh, discs? appear to be <laughs> protruding. All five of your lumbar vertebrae. All of the ones they could see in the scan. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was funny because the radiologist was like, do you have any back pain? I'm like, no, not yet. Yeah. Sometimes, but not not currently. He goes, right. Hmm. <laughs> cool. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like the, it's like John Oliver, cool. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so that, that's a good point though. So, you know, when people on our Instagrams at, say, hey, I uh, herniated a disc the other day when I was deadlifting, confirmed by MRI, it's like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, did you get an MRI before you were deadlifting and there was no herniation? And then right. after you had this, and then there was a herniation and those things yeah. were like a couple days apart. Cause that's the only way I'm buying this. You know, right. it's right. highly likely that you just had a herniated disc before and now you have back pain. Yeah. And, and the same thing, even, even worse when people tell us they herniated a disc and they don't even have the MRI because they said they felt something shift in their back. Right. And it's like, no, that's, you don't know what happened down there. And your sense, your subjective sensation of what you felt does not 
is not uh, very sensitive or specific for the diagnosis of a herniated disc, for example. So point being, when you go and you get these sorts of imaging studies done, and then you see the radiologist's interpretation. Say you get the report yourself, and you get to read the radiologist's language, and they talk about you know, evidence of degeneration and herniation and a lot of really scary words. And within your social context, your whole life, you might have heard about your dad, say, had back pain, or say he was in the military, a paratrooper or something, and he had a bunch of back pain issues, and he talks about his discs hurting all the time, or he had back surgery and had a bad outcome. All those sorts of social things in addition to the language itself, can all influence your perception as to what's going on. And the more that ant that kind of, you, you know, winds you up, gets you more anxious, afraid, uh, terrified to move, definitely not going to go deadlift, uh, actually that ends up resulting in your pain being more persistent, more, you know, diffi more difficult to treat, uh, and, uh, and worse outcomes usually. Yep. So, you know, that's what that's what I observe most of the time is the is the doctors who tell the patients, "Oh, your x-ray looks horrible. You have the knees worst of x worst x-ray I've ever yeah, seen." Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a, the worst thing you can say to somebody. Or you have the x-ray of uh, insert your age plus 50 years uh, you know, like I, you have the x-ray of an 85-year-old back or something like that as if to say like you have, you know, really damaged yourself and you're broken and things like that. Um, if you ever bend over again, you're going to be paralyzed. Not that people tend to actually say that, but that's kind of the implication is if you move the wrong way with this bulging disc, you could end up being a paraplegic, all that kind of stuff that results in a lot of fear, avoidance behavior uh, in, in patients. Horrible, horrible things to say to people. You blew out your back. Bl just that phrase alone. We saw that one earlier today. We saw an image if, on Instagram of a guy if, bending over. If you are you want to say <laughs> a health professional and you made an infographic, first off, I'm upset with you. Yes. And if that infographic, just in general, infographics, okay. Yes. And if that infographic says don't how to blow out your back or how to not blow out your back or did you blow out your back and it shows a cartoon character with like, you know, the ouch. <laughs> it was, no, dude, it was a mushroom cloud coming, <laughs> coming out of this guy's back as he bent over to pick up a golf ball. It was on one of these Mayo Detox idiots page. I'll just call him out. That's fine. Uh, he had a mushroom cloud coming out of his back. What do you think that perception does to yeah, people? Yeah, so you actually just hurt, you just harmed people. You just, just harmed, harmed 250,000 views that that thing had. All yeah. of those people have yeah. now are now worse because of what you, you just, just did. People. When your nutritionist tells you if you eat a certain thing, you're going to feel this certain, you know, this bad thing's going to happen to you outside of like you have celiac or like, you know, some, some related thing. That's also the nocebo effect. You just hurt, you just harmed people. Okay, and that's on you. And if you can sleep at night, great. But we're telling you that if you are in a position of power, the nocebo effect can actually harm people and you need to watch what you're saying. So don't say that, you know, this specific thing is harmful, that people have a negative connotation with. Like that's, you know, unfortunately we communicate in a way that we find most effective and sometimes that's gonna happen. But as much as you can watch to not, uh, you know, screw people up. Yeah. You know? The natural history of most of these things, as we said, is to get better unless you mess it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so basically, it, out, even outside the acute injury context, this thing is way more uh, broad and important implications. So basically, you can think of any kind of nonspecific symptom out there. Most, almost all of those nonspecific symptoms are prone to the placebo effect. You can give them in trials, treat, you know, comparing a drug to placebo, you do both. And even in the placebo arm, you see some evidence of effect from it because the placebo effect influences all these other nonspecific symptoms, things like nausea, things like fatigue, things like these nonspecific aches and pains, uh, libido, like all this kind of stuff can be influenced by the placebo effect. Anything that can be influenced by the placebo effect can similarly be impacted by the nocebo effect. So if we're talking outside of the context of these acute injury things, um, let's say let's say you uh, you feel a little tired when you're grinding out the end of your novice LP, and uh, 12 hours after you do your uh, you know 10 out of 10 death set of squats, you go and you get your testosterone measured and it's low. And your coach tells you that's why you're that's why you're feeling tired. That's why you're not recovering. That's why you're not making progress because your testosterone level is 350, yeah. and you are 24 years old. You should have a testosterone level of 900. And and you go and say you do manage to get this person on TRT, and maybe they do make some more progress in the gym, 
but by and large, a lot of the people that I've worked with who are on TRT or pursued TRT, it was not the cure-all that they expected, particularly in the, lift, in the lifting community because it's hyped up, these low T clinics, they expect that it's gonna cure their fatigue and their aches and their pains and they're gonna get super jacked and they're gonna sleep perfectly, their mood's gonna be awesome, their focus and concentration are gonna be great. But really, it was somebody telling them this stuff that oh, they had all these issues, and so they, they, they focused more and more on these symptoms, and they said, yeah, you know, when the more I pay attention, the more tired I am, the worse my concentrate, all this kind of stuff. And, and so you go and you're, you're harming people with this stuff. Um, so, you know, people who are clinically have, you know, you can prove that they're hypogonadal, for example. Yeah, they need testosterone replacement. But if you have somebody who's, you know, within generally within the normal range and you're attributing a whole bunch of nonspecific symptoms to it, uh, I am no longer surprised anymore when I see those people get on testosterone and they still say, hey, I still have these issues with sleep or with mood or whatever. And it's like, yeah, because you were depressed, you know, for a bunch of other reasons, or you have sleep apnea, or you have thyroid dysfunction, you know, some, some other issues. So, so all this is to say that all these nonspecific symptoms, we need to be careful how we describe them, how we talk about them. The worst predictor for a lot of the outcomes in these things is catastrophizing. That's a condition when somebody, if somebody has an ache or a pain, they immediately perceive it to be like the worst possible scenario. So people who have that kind of little shift in their low back when they're deadlifting, they're like, oh God, I just herniated a disc. I can never enter the gym again. Those people do the worst. So we need to break that cycle and get people to stop freaking out about all of this stuff. Yep. Yep. The testosterone thing is another pet peeve. We've been seeing we've been seeing a whole lot of it. Um, you know, test levels of 400 coming and saying, you know, I heard that was really low for for my age or something, and you know, nope, nope. <laughs> yep. Almost a third of the males at the London Olympics tested actually low. Yeah, interesting. And we're drug we're drug free. I think I think Bryce Lewis actually recently posted uh, posted something about his his test levels. Uh, because he went and got it checked, and he's the what, what weight class? He's 105 kilo. Yeah. Uh, he won Raw Nationals, just absolutely insane lifts, and his test level is like 300 or something like that. <gasps> no, how is it possible? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so so this stuff is is more complicated than that, and so we have to be careful how we talk about these things. If we say just like a back X-ray saying you have the back of a 90 year old to tell somebody that they're, you know, they're they're tired because they have the testosterone levels of a 90 year old is in my mind essentially the same thing. So yeah, it would be malpractice if these people were. An actual medical practice, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, yeah that, what are you that, gonna do? That's the thing. You, you, if you don't have training, you just say whatever you want. You know, you just, whatever you want. No consequences. It's totally fine. Um, okay, for our final three to five minutes. Okay. When we're gonna talk about soft tissue therapies, ways to recover. Because how do you improve recovery? You know, how do you how do you do this? So Austin, when do you when you know when do you recommend massage? Uh, I don't. Okay, when do you when do you recommend <laughs> Graston, an ART? Uh, also, generally don't. Okay, when do you recommend uh, spinal adjustment and manipulation? Essentially, never. Okay. Okay, this is harder than I thought. When do you recommend when do you recommend foam rolling though? Nope. Okay, um, I'm just you know. What about an ice bath? So 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 also don't. And that one actually <laughs> impairs like impairs farm. recovery like more farm. than helps it. Yeah. So so the deal with these things is the only time. I, so I won't even say that I outwardly recommend it, but the only time I'll be like, yeah, sure, go give it a shot, is when somebody comes to me with one of these issues and they are just like gushing with excitement and how much they believe this yep. is like the greatest exactly. thing that's going to help them. Exactly. Because what I'm doing is, as I said, I'm leveraging the placebo effect. Of course, there are some ethical issues with going and paying somebody to provide you with that service. Um, and, and in my opinion, the best way to do things to patients is under informed consent. And if we were to truly inform them about this, we would eliminate the placebo yeah, effect. Stop working. But if they say, you know, uh, my, my, my best friend, all, all my best friends who've ever like tweaked this thing, they ended up going and getting ART and they're all fixed and squatting 800 pounds now. I'm like, dude, you are going to feel great after yeah. you get that done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but exactly. somebody else who doesn't, who doesn't come to me with that expectation, I do not generally recommend them. They, they go to pursue these certain things because they... They are primarily passive modalities. 
where you're lying there having things done to you, when I would prefer to find a way for you to train and help to manage this thing yourself, increase your self-efficacy so that you don't feel the need to go and do these things and be dependent on other people to take care of issues that you can take care of almost every time you can. Again, in the absence of surgery, which I don't recommend operating on yourself, but uh, the yeah. rest of these things you can take care of on your own. Like if you're in a, in Antarctica, you know, and you're the only physician and your appendix <laughs> you have to ruptures, take care. sometimes <laughs> you, you gotta go. do an auto appendectomy. Yeah, yeah, just whip out your pocket knife and go to town. <laughs> That's fine. Well, that was the case. They did that. Uh, somebody did that. There's a, there's a case study that's auto appendectomy. They're like you like mirrors. Yeah, like the worst thing to do would be yeah. like, I'm a family medicine doctor. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, I'm, I, you just. Does anyone have any antibiotics, please? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I, and I agree with you. I think those uh, modalities, if someone has a big belief system in a, uh, with them, they've used them historically with, to great benefit, then sure, that's cool. I'm, I'm down. And you have the mon- if you have the money and the time to, to, yeah. to blow on it, go for it. Yeah. yeah, but I wouldn't recommend them routinely, and I don't think that you know, the evidence does not support the, the, you know, the use of of the this. routine use of them for the treatment or prevention of most of these sorts of injuries yeah, that we're talking about. of injury, or they don't improve recovery as measured by objective performance. The, you know, so you got to wonder, you know. Yeah. Here's, here's another interesting thing, uh, really interesting in my mind, is that given that fatigue is not only a, a manifestation of kind of our training, but also to the ex- in a way you can think of it as kind of one of these nonspecific symptoms, right? It can come from a whole bunch of different things. Sure. So let's say that uh, you, <clears throat> you are training and your coach is programming for you to uh, use progressively higher training volumes over time as they are going to get stronger and stronger. And they have told you that this is basically the way that the evidence suggests and in their experience suggests that uh, we can improve training outcomes over the long term for athletes is to increase their dose of stress that they're receiving primarily through increasing this. Uh, And it's dosed very carefully, intensity is modulated accordingly, and they feel, they, 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 they train, they get some expected level of fatigue, we allow them to dissipate that fatigue when appropriate, they recover, they peak, they PR, repeat cycle, etc. Right. In comparison, you have somebody who you say, you are above, insert arbitrary age here, you are above age 40, which I've seen recently, and any increase in training volume is going to profoundly beat you up more than it would for your 20 year younger counterpart. You're gonna feel horrible, you're gonna feel super sore, every joint's gonna hurt, you're gonna wake up in pain every day. You can see where I'm going with this. It's getting, it, 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 this is, is going to, this is, this is going to wreck you. <laughs> what do you propose is going to happen when you do that to the person? They're gonna notice themselves more, feeling more tired. They're gonna pay attention to every ache and pain that they probably get routinely in training anyway, attribute it to that. They're gonna start to catastrophize, oh no, this week I have to do five sets of five on the squat. I'm gonna be just destroyed for the rest of the week. How am I ever gonna survive this? And then they feel terrible, they get injured, they catastrophize first. So you could definitely argue that that sort of language that you give to a trainee sets certain expectations that tends to result in something of a self-confirming kind of yes, prophecy it's a afterwards. Self-fulfilling prophecy, yeah. Right. Exactly. So, so you know, be uh, careful what you say to people. Yeah, folks. <laughs> if you, folks. Yeah. If you're in a position of power, you use that power wisely. And, well, now that we're done with our PSA about how to speak with other humans. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was a whole. That was a whole lot of our like favorite topics that we managed to cram into that lecture, uh, yeah. into this podcast. I mean, sorry. Yeah. So hey, thanks for tuning in. If you like more of the stuff, hit subscribe uh, on the YouTube so we can get Austin behind the camera. He's so handsome on camera now. And uh, what do you guys want to hear about next? So we have our own list of things that you know we'd like to cover. But if you guys have some burning desires we haven't already talked about. Hit us up. We're on the social medias. Austin, where can people find more of your stuff? So I have a bunch of articles on the Barbell Medicine website, the Starting Strength website. I am newly minted Austin underscore Barbell Medicine on Instagram. Uh, And then also, guys, if you found this helpful, uh, go over to iTunes and uh, leave us a review. Yep. More importantly, share it. Send it out. Get this out. We want to we, we want to trigger a bunch of people. So if you uh, send this bad boy out, um, that'll be useful. 
And uh, anyway. So let people know what we got coming up next. Yeah, so this weekend we're at Untamed Strength in Sacramento. We got a Barbell Medicine Seminar, it's our second one. Uh, we are also scheduled to go in March to uh, Arizona. So that's available on the barbellmedicine.com website. You can sign up for that, or you can do it on Eventbrite. Both links are in the show notes. Uh, also, we're looking at getting out to Maryland in uh, the spring springtime. We've got a shirt in the works for Senor Baraki. What are you going to do, not train? Yeah, coming out soon. I think it's just no, going to be your face. After, uh, yeah. <laughs> just put my Valsalva face on the front. And yeah, then, yeah. On the, and, then, uh, and then after June of this year, uh, as soon as I uh, you know, wrap this uh, indentured servitude up in residency, we're going to blow this thing up with uh, more frequent seminars. We're going to probably do a world tour of some sort later Aw on. So. Austin's actually moving in. <laughs> <laughs> the rain's moving out. Austin's Sorry. moving in. <laughs> anyway. Yep. Cool. All right, guys. We'll catch you next time. See you.